Um, I'm Kyle Cleveland with TUJ's Institute of Contemporary Asian Studies. I, I'm really happy, actually proud, that our university has the opportunity to host this kind of event. Uh, Temple University, Japan, has students from over 65 countries, and we're a very diverse university, but often that's in terms of nationality or race and not in terms of issues related to some of the topics we'll be discussing today. And it's also a very timely issue. Uh, in the last year since uh, Valentine's Day, multiple lawsuits have been filed seeking equal marriage rights. And the panelists had mentioned that just within their network, there are over 30 lawyers who are working on this. Um, the speakers that we have this evening are Alexander, Alexander Dmitrenko. He's a representative director and one of the co-founders of Lawyers for LGBT and Allies Network. Alexander began his career in Canada, including working on same-sex marriage and other LGBT right cases. He received his Master of Law degree from NYU and has practiced in New York and Tokyo. He's currently a senior associate in the Tokyo office of Freshfields Brunghaus Derringer, focusing on regulation and compliance matters. I don't know if it's relevant. He's from Canada, originally from the Ukraine. Um, <laughs> go Raptors, right? Go Raptors. We also have with us Makiko Terahara. She's the co-representative of Marriage for All Japan, really has been a leading voice and a figure in this, which aims to create society where everyone can choose to marry regardless of orientation or gender. She's co-representative of Tokyo Amote Sando LPC and a lawyer of the Tokyo Bar Association. Graduated from Todai and received her Master of Law degree from NYU in 2007. And finally, we have Naosuke Fujita, who's a co-representative director and one of the co-founders of Lawyers for LGBT and Allies Network. He is a graduate of Waseda University Department of Law and the University of Michigan Law School. Following a career as a business lawyer at Japanese and U.S. law firms, Naosuke is general counsel for Goldman Sachs Japan since 2009 and an ally of its LGBT network. In June of 2017, he was rewarded by Financial Times the most innovative general counsel award in connection with these activities. So we will, they will speak for about 50 minutes in total, and then we'll have an extended Q&A. Um, before... Makiko speaks. Um, I think Fujita will say something about her. But uh, yes, yeah. So um, I just wanted to say that um, Makiko is one of the leaders in the marriage equality movement in Japan. It is very rare that you see social movements in Japan, as you will all appreciate. And um, I think uh, Makiko has been. Um, trying to engage people over the past five to 10 years um, and seeking ways to engage people. She's been very active, but uh, recently she has stepped up. And uh, as you may have heard, and she will talk about, uh, she has two um, uh, pillars of the social movement. First is litigation. And uh, she initiated litigation this year. Uh, this is strategic litigation with 13 couples and, but what she also realized, and she learned from Evan Wolfson, uh, who is said to be the godfather of uh, freedom to marry in the United States, that it's not enough to do litigation. You have to change the hearts and mind of the people. And so her Marriage for All Japan, did I get it right? Marriage for All Japan, that organization she runs uh, with other uh, her co colleagues is designed to change society to change the hearts and minds of society and to get enga engagement and conversation going. So, and she is one of the rare leaders uh, in Japan who can lead that movement. So I'm very, very proud and honored to be next to her. I feel very timid to be next to her, but um, um, you know, I, I very much look forward to hearing your speech. So we start, okay. <laughs> Um, well, uh, with those introductions, I mean, uh, thank you everyone for coming. Uh, I probably will stand up just because I know the slides by heart um, and I want to see you all uh, properly. Um, we're very happy to be here today. It's indeed very special to have Makiko and Fujita Sensei with us to share um, the vision of Japan as we're entering this uh, time when Japan is considering equality. Um, what we also 
here to do, and this is kind of my part, is talk about the f experience internationally. Um, thankfully for Japan, it doesn't need to be in a vacuum, and it can learn from the world. Um, I was lucky in my career to begin working in Canada when we were in a vacuum, and there was no other uh, same-sex marriage anywhere in the world. And our cases uh, in Ontario and other provinces were the first ones in the world to claim for uh, equal rights for uh, lesbian and gay couples. Um, that's been now many, many years ago. So I'll talk about this, and Makiko will share again, uh, the focus of this presentation will be to talk for Makiko to talk, talk about the current situation here in Japan, where the lawsuits are, and other um, areas around it. And Fujita Sensei will talk about a very important point, which we believe in is the corporate support and ally support for equal marriage. Most of you here presume are allies. So I want to say a huge thank you for being here, supporting our rights, our quality, taking your time to do so, and it really is important to us. With that, let me begin where we are in the world and before we come to Japan. There are 27 countries um, in the world where there is equal marriage. And this number continuously increases. Um, the whole list is here. Critically, um, out of G7, five countries have equal marriage. Italy has a partnership law. Most of Japan's peers, uh, speaking you know, economically, internationally, culturally, have equal marriage, including, including Taiwan. And I'll talk about Taiwan in a second. There are many countries that have partnership rights, uh, which allow basically the same benefits for uh, lesbian and gay couples without the name marriage. And we'll talk why marriage matters and why that's not enough. And there are a few countries where it's pending because the courts have ruled already in favor of equal marriage, but uh, the legislation has to catch up. So we're not in top 30 yet. We have only a few more places to go if Japan wants to do it quickly. So it depends on Makiko's some work <laughs> and your support. Um, but equal marriage came to Asia, um, not just this, this May, a couple of years ago. The Supreme Court in Taiwan, High Court in Taiwan, ruled in May two years ago that the denying marriage rights to lesbian and gay couples was unconstitutional. It was discrimination that was no, not justified. There was no justification in law or otherwise to deny that to these couples. And they deserved equal benefits under the law. They deserved equality, full equality under the law. Taiwan's Supreme Court um, um, gave two years to the government to legislate properly. And as you might have heard, there were a couple of referendums, and there was a lot of uh, religious support uh, against marriage, uh, coming from the US in particular. Um, now, in May 17 this year, uh, Taiwan's, government, Taiwan's parliament did vote in favor of equal marriage. There are some caveats. It's not entirely equal to the marriage that exists between heterosexual couples. Uh, there's adoption rights that are still in the question. There are a couple of other ca caveats. But critically, in Asia, now you can see the country that's closest to Japan culturally and historically has equal marriage for now a month, and the world has not collapsed. And there are now over a thousand couples who have married in Taiwan and can f join, join the happiness that, that marriage can bring with it, and also the obligations and other things that marriage can bring. Now, this is very important because um, for Asia, we obviously were missing from the world map of marriage. If you saw my prior slide, uh, you see here, really the entire world is covered. South Africa, New Zealand, Australia, multiple jurisdictions in, in America, in Latin America, Europe obviously le leading the way. So we definitely welcome this in Asia, and I think this will make a big difference for us. But what really makes a difference, I think, is to look back and say, one of the first countries in the world that did have equal marriage was Canada. So I'll talk about my country and why, where we are now, nearly 15 years later, since the marriage case. But it's a movement, similar to what Markiko is doing here, that began many, many years ago. In October 1973, the Toronto City uh, Hall issued the LGBT ordinance saying there should be no discrimination. That's how many years ago? I'm, not, I'm a lawyer, I can't count. <laughs> but you can count how many years ago that was that. Tokyo did similar thing only last year. We can't be 50 years later behind, because we <laughs> it's just really um, not right in a sense. 
Canada moved gradually to talk about the marriage. They were uh, um, common law initially to, again, help with women who were not in marriage situations but who needed the protection of the law. The common law was allowed to, rec to be recognized to protect women, and then the same-sex couples were allowed to enter the same common law institution. Um, this is my client here, a Metropolitan Community Church of Toronto. The religious institution led the way to equal marriage in Canada. And the couples that were married by the MCCT are legally the first couples in the world that are married. And I'll give you this interesting, those of you who always will appreciate this. When we went to Ontario court, the court of first instance said, similar to what the Taiwan court said, there is discrimination in law. We can definitely see it. There is no justification for discrimination. But we want to give the government two years to figure out how to fix it. Because at the time, there was no one else in the world who had this marriage. Canada was first, in a sense. So the court of first instance gave two years to the Canadian government. We were not happy, because why should our equality wait for two years while bureaucrats figuring out what to do? We appealed, and then the government appealed because they weren't happy because they had to do something. They don't like to work. Um, and critically, a year later, the Ontario's Court of Appeal ruled Equality cannot wait. Why are we giving two years to the government to figure it out? It's very clear. These couples deserve equality. We have charter of rights. They need, to be, they need to be equal now. And the court said, those couples married here by MCCT in 2001, we're going to recognize their marriage as legal retroactively. So I'm very proud to say and share the story, even though Canada wasn't the first country in the world to actually adopt the marriage Act in 2005, the Netherlands and Belgium were before us, but we were the first ones to do this. And I'm very proud that it was a religious institution that, that, that helped us. Because in Canada, the, the, the Marriage Act had a, a, um, two clauses. One is equal marriage for LGBT, for lesbian and gay, with all the rights that go along with it. But the second clause was, religious institutions in Canada were not forced to perform marriages they didn't believe in. And that was the compromise Canada reached to allow Marriage Act to be adopted. So if Catholic Church of Canada did not want to perform equal marriages, they didn't have to. But the city clerk, the public official we're all paying taxes to, could not discriminate. They had to be treating us equally. Now, with that passion, allow me to continue, because I'm probably going to take more than 15 minutes. Um, but because I do want to set the stage for why we need it in, in Japan, and Makika will explain to you where we are. The consequences, again, the world did not collapse after we had marriage in 2005. Canada is one of the most wonderful countries, the, one of the best women's rights, uh, one of the best, uh, the, the most uh, refugee uh, people coming to Canada out, out of any country in the world. We have a lot to be proud of. Raptors did win our first NBA championship. I mean, there's a lot of things to be proud of, exactly. Um, but no negative consequences. And you know what was funny? When, when the marriage debate took place in Canada, you know what happened? The divorce rates have fallen. Straight people realized that they had something they took for granted that wasn't available to LGBT. The marriages went up and divorce rates went, went down, something we can relate to here in Japan. People don't think about it. I have a junior colleague of mine who is a Bengoshi and Japanese lawyer, and she got married last year. And I said to her, congratulations, you can marry I can't, and my, my partner's here today, I'm not gonna point out. So that I can't marry my partner, but you can marry your husband. And she said to me, oh, I wanna help make the change. And now we're using my colleague to do this. But this is critical for people to start thinking about it. You take for granted something you have as a straight person and we don't have. It's, equality is not a pie. It's not like, you know, if I'm gonna be able to get married, someone's not gonna be able to get married. That's not the case. Equality belongs to everyone. We're all human beings. We all deserve to be equal. It does impact pride and indignity. Um, there are stronger families. The Canadian mosaic. I'm going to just go very quickly through this. Um, the, qual the equality is good for business. We just doesn't say we'll talk about this, why, and how. And Tourism Canada, we, we benefited from the gay money coming to Canada. Because, look, when we had the gay marriage, Americans, they're always behind us. I'm, I know there are many Americans here. Guys, <laughs> you're, we, you, you're our big neighbor, but you're totally behind, yeah? 
And we had so many gay couples coming to Canada and, uh, because we, there's no residency requirement to get married. But I'm, as a lawyer, I had to tell them there's residency requirement to get divorced. If you come to Canada to get married, you're welcome to, but one of you will have to come back for a year before you can annul your marriage. So be sure you make those vows wholeheartedly and forever. Um, so, and critically, actually, for Canada, all those couples who came up and they went down back to the States, they were some of the ones who led the marriage equality fight in the US. They said, how come Canada can give us equal marriage and my own state cannot? And that's how I think a lot of states w took place in, in the US. Um, this slide is very important because public support in Canada moved from EC47, uh, the post, 26 the post, but support grew dr dr drastically. And most critically, I wanted really to talk to you about this. We had um, our survey um, in 2017, our last census, where the question was asked, no, no longer, I, I, during these years, the question was, do you support equal marriage for Canadians, for LGBT Canadians? So at this stage, there were like 85% support. This. So like, well, that's, we're gonna change the question. Do you feel proud that it, that it is great at Canada to people have um, uh, the right to marry? So change the question from, do you support the equality? Do you feel proud as a Canadian that your neighbors who are gay and lesbian can marry? And you have 75% and now it's even more. People who said yes. Now think of these people coming to Japan. I have friends coming here and they're appalled and shocked to find out there are no rights for LGBT in Japan. No, zero rights in Japan at all. Marriage is kind of like, is a, is a, is a you know, golden ideal but there's no discrimination, there's no partnership, there's no benefits, there's no insurance, there's no visa, there's nothing. You can be fired for being gay. Canadians overwhelmingly, 80% feel proud that they extend equality to gays and lesbians and hope one day we will feel the same way here in Japan. Another element where we can relate is the suicide rates. The study was done in the US and in Canada. How does it impact the community? of LGBT people. And one thing they found out, the teens at the most critical stage in their life, when they coming out to themselves, facing the world, that's majority straight, they might not have the network to support them, um, and they might believe that they don't have a you know, future. When the government and the law tells them, you're equal, you like your love, the most sacred thing you can have, your heart and your love and your dignity are equal to anyone else's. That saves lives, actually. The Canadian studies showed 15 to 30% drop in suicide rates of teens in LGBT. The US study was even better. They compared the states, individual states where there was equal marriage and those that, that did not. And again, they saw a difference of 15 to 30% in suicide rates for LGBT. Something for Japan to think about. We have this problem here. I work for TEL, uh, which is our English language lifeline, and 25 to 30% of callers are LGBT because they experience issues where they, they don't have the community, they don't have friends, uh, it's a very foreign, foreign environment, and it's very tricky. People, people do face a lot of issues. The, 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 the message that the government can send saying you're equal and your love and your heart is important and your happiness is protected. This is very important and I want to, again to say it does save lives. Political visibility, um, very important as well. In Canada we're very lucky, we have plenty of gay people um, um, in parliament. We have a prime minister who couldn't be uh, more supportive, and if you're Canadian, please vote for Justin Trudeau in upcoming election. Um, look, I think it's very important to have role models. Again, in Japan, we, ha we lack it a little bit. We have one member of parliament uh, who is openly lesbian. We hope to have a few more. We have many, many more transgender people and other LGBT on, on uh, prefectural level, municipal level, but we need more of those ambassadors. Even if you're not gay, you can be our ambassador and our ally, so, and that's very important to us. Now, it's good for business. I'm not going to preempt for just a speech, but it is really good for business. Canada now has 20 years of empirical experience to prove that gay people will work better, 
will be more committed and will feel that they belong if the company supports them and their relationship. Now, I've talk, talked about the, some, some of the census that we do in Canada. We do include same-sex couples in Canada, special part of the survey that targets the uh, same-sex couples. I was very upset that the American uh, census this year did not include same-sex couples, unfortunately. Um, but you can see um, some of the numbers here. Um, about 1% of all couples declared to be same-sex. Um, and third of them were married. When people ask, why do you want to marry? Why is it important to you? Here's a number. It's very important. You know, when you think about it, marriage and death are the only times when you can have all the loved ones in one place. Except for when you're dead, you don't really care. But when you marry, you want, you want to have the ability to have everyone in your room, and you don't want to be called civil partnership or something else. You want to have a full right to be able to celebrate with whole heart and your family and your loved ones. And, and the state recognizing you wholeheartedly. And you can see it is important to 33% at least of those Canadians who are LGBT. Um, we do live in big cities. Tokyo would be another example, and Osaka, just because community is easier to, to, be, to be integrated. Um, but I want to show you this, this graph as well, because it's, again, it's important because you see the history here. So in 01, there was no equal marriage. In 06, you now see it starting the, the dark blue the couples now uh, starting to get married and take advantage of the institution and the rights that it comes with. People ask often, how does it affect families? Well, you know, gay people can have kids. I mean, it sounds shocking to a lot of people. Uh, we can have kids, hello. Um, and not only that, uh, studies have shown kids who are raised by gay parents do better in school. I don't want to say that straight people don't do their, their job well. I think it's because, I think it's really because it's so amazing for us to have this family and to have kids and to raise them. We will probably will take extra care to ensure that the kids are successful and, the, and the loved and all of that has been given them as much as we can. So in Canada, you see again, a lot of kids who are now being raised, grow up in families. And what it does also, when you think about diversity, in Canada, we believe in mosaic. Uh, America's melting pot, we're a mosaic, where we think you don't have to move away from your identity. We have a lot of people from the Caribbean in Canada. Keep it. We want you to be different. We want you the diversity in Canada. Same thing for LGBT. Please keep your diversity. Please, please contribute it to our society. Let's have a beautiful mosaic. And the children who grow up now in those families, they will be the next generation where it's normal to be gay. It's normal to have two moms and dads. Um, and it's going to be OK uh, further, further. And I think you will see this kind of impact internationally as well. Um, I'm going to stop here because we really, I hope all of you can, came here to hear to Mar Markiko speak. Um, I will be able to answer questions, obviously, and I will help with Fujitsun Say's speech. But the last point I wanted to make, really, um, look, it, it marriage matters. Equality matters. We, as lawyers, we train to fight for, for fairness, fight for equality, fight for freedom. And these things matter for individuals. They do matter for companies, and they, they do matter for countries. Um, and uh, all of us here in Japan, and those of us who are international from Japan, we come from experience when we know what it's supposed to be like, what equality feels like, and how wonderful it is, how much happiness it can grieve, and how wonderful for the community and individuals. All we're here to do is to share the experience with Japan and we are in great hands of people like Makiko Tarahara. Thank you. Uh, thank you for this opportunity. I'm very proud to be here. I will talk about the lawsuits in Japan. Uh, on February 14th, uh, St. Valentine's Day, uh, we filed the first ever lawsuits in Japan over unconstitutionality of not allowing same-sex marriage to the court simultaneously in Sapporo, Tokyo, Nagoya, and Osaka. Uh, on Valentine's Day, people celebrate their loves with their partners. So we chose this day, uh, hoping that same-sex couples can celebrate uh, Valentine's Day like other people. 
What are the key arguments of the lawsuits? Um, our claim is based on two legal arguments. Uh, firstly, it is um, infringement on freedom of marriage for same-sex couples. Under Article 24, Paragraph 1 of the Constitution of Japan, uh, heterosexual couples can choose to get married. And if they choose to marry, then they can choose whom they marry and when they marry. They have uh, the freedom of marriage. But uh, regardless of whether heterosexual or not, a couple may have desire to form a relationship as marriage and live together for the rest of the time. There is no difference in the lifestyle between heterosexual couples and same-sex sex couples. Uh, so uh, given that the freedom of marriage must be guaranteed for same-sex same couples, and the current legal system, which does not allow marriage for same-sex couples, uh, conflicts with this article. The second argument is that um, same-sex couples are discriminated based on their sexual orientation, and it is against uh, the principle of equality. Under for Article 14 of the Constitution, all of the people are equal. If someone receives unequal treatment, for example, heterosexual couples can enjoy various legal and economic benefits because they can get married, uh, while same-sex couples cannot enjoy such benefits because they cannot get married, uh, and it is due to their sexual orientation, which is not a choice, it contradicts the principle of equality. You may have heard this argument that same-sex marriage is prohibited under the Constitution of Japan. This argument is based on the wording of Article 24, Paragraph 1, which says marriage shall be based only on the mutual consent of both sexes. Those who make this argument say both sexes mean male and female, and therefore marriage is only effective between male and female. But it is a wrong interpretation in light of the history and rationale behind this article. That is, under the old civil code, under the old constitution, um, people can get married only if the head of the family approves it. That system is called family system, or Ieseido in Japanese. But the new civil code and new constitution demolished the system, so a couple can marry by themselves. The purpose of this article is to respect individual dignity and prevent interference by a third party other than the couple. It is not the purpose of this article to exclude same-sex couples. So it is clearly a wrong interpretation that this article bans same-sex marriage. Rather, paragraph 2 states that with regard to choice of spouse, laws must be made from the standpoint of individual dignity. It means when you choose your spouse, your choice must be respected. Uh, you may sometimes see 
this argument. Wouldn't a partnership or similar system suffice? There are many uh, various benefits for married couple under Japanese law, but uh, those benefits are not available to the couple in marriage, in fact, which is, uh, as, which is also known as common law marriage. For instance, how long, no matter how long, uh, the couple uh, live together, they cannot inherit the property as a spouse when the partner passes away. Uh, or in the case of a couple of a Japanese and a non-Japanese, heterosexual couple can get married and the non-Japanese partner will get the status of a residence as a spouse. Although same-sex couples cannot get married, so uh, the non-Japanese partner cannot get a status of a residence or as a spouse, which means they might not be able to live together in Japan. You may wish uh, to solve problems in alternative ways other than legal marriage. <coughs> but even if you use other tools, it is far from benefits that are granted to married couples. In Japan, uh, partnership certificates, which was originally started by Shibuya World, is spreading across Japan. Someone say that you can obtain the partnership certificate and get satisfied, but unfortunately, uh, the certificate does not have any legal effect, and a couple cannot get uh, any benefits that are granted to married couple. Uh, those who oppose uh, same-sex marriage say marriage is for procreation and thus it is unnecessary to allow uh, marriage for same-sex couples who cannot produce babies. But no rules, there are no rules uh, by law that you cannot get married if you cannot have children. Indeed, even if you cannot have children for the reasons like disease or physical constitution, you can still get married. And once you get married, you will not be forced to divorce because they, uh, you have no children. Marriage is not for pre procreation, but for happiness of people who want to live together with their partner uh, as a family. So uh, it is unreasonable to deny uh, the same-sex marriage because they have no children. How can you support equal marriage in Japan? To realize same-sex marriage as soon as possible, we have formed an association called Marriage for All Japan. I am the representative director, and many members overlap with the lawyers of the lawsuits for same-sex marriage. Our mission is to um, run various campaigns to raise awareness of this issue in the society outside of the court. As a part of that campaigns, we are running uh, the event a code, let's talk about same-sex marriage. In Japan, people do not talk about same-sex marriage in day-to-day -day life, so it is important 
to have more opportunities to discuss with friends about same-sex couples. We are planning uh, this kind of events across Japan. And for those who cannot attend the event, we are also creating movies where sexual minority and their families tell what they think about this situation. And heterosexual allies give uh, messages to support. We have information, we post uh, this kind of information on our website. And there is an uh, English version, so uh, please check. Um, I always think that this lawsuit or campaign is not for just uh, same-sex couples. Uh, I'm heterosexual, but I sometimes feel pressures, societal pressures, uh, to, like, to act like a woman. Um, uh, and even heterosexual ma men uh, might feel some social pressures that it make difficult to follow their own passes. Uh, I think uh, so in that case, uh, and in addition, I you can probably say that uh, every single individual on Earth is a minority in some aspects. So in that sense, I think uh, this lawsuit or campaign is for all the people, not just for same-sex couples, for all people who want to live their own lives. Finally, I finish my part with an inspiring quote from what two old plaintiffs told on the first hearing on April 15. Let's begin with Ono-san, who has a female uh, partner. We have together cried, laughed, worried, argued, and raised children. Why are we not recognized as a family by law? Why are only couples of a man and a woman considered as a family? Families like us are not special. We live in everywhere in this country from Hokkaido to Okinawa. We are not known because we try not to stand out for our children. Please do not ignore families living now. Please do not consider as if they never existed. The last is Sato-san. He has a male partner. I have some diseases as well as HIV. I am aware I have only 10 years or even less to live. It would be the happiest thing in my life if my partner and I were accepted as a real married couple while I am still alive. I will go to the heaven first but at the last moment, I hope we hold hands of each other as a married couple and say, thank you, my life is full of happiness before leaving for the heaven. My partner is not here in the seats of plaintiffs because he has not told his colleagues or family that he is a gay. I'd like to introduce his comments. I have become a plaintiff without appearing in public. Honestly, I want to be there with my partner as usual, but I cannot do it under the current circumstances. I hope we win this case, and in the end, I can show my smile in public. Thank you for listening. So um, I guess it's very hard to speak after these two and talk about the corporate sector. Um, but, um, you know, as Makiko was saying, and as we spoke earlier, there are two pillars to the strategy to change Japan, to realize marriage equality, 
litigation, and social engagement. So I think the topic I have is how do we engage the corporates? And that's a big challenge. But um, how do I use this? Oh, got it. <laughs> but uh, I, I, forgive me, but I want to start with a personal story because um, I think that kind of delivers the message more clearly why I'm involved in this. Um, four years ago, I would not have imagined I would be standing in front of these, in front of all of you talking about marriage equality. I am a corporate and business lawyer from head to toe, and my blood is blue. <laughs> Um, but something happened in May 2015, and that is someone who worked for me came out as gay. And you will gasp, but he was the first real gay person I ever met. Meaning, there were probably gay people around me, but none of them had come out to me. And he's probably the second. <laughs> um, <laughs> but then, you know, um, I engaged in conversation with him and uh, I learned about the difficulties he faces. And uh, I asked him, what is the thing you most want to realize now that you've come out? And he said, marriage equality. And I said, why is that? And he said, it's because I want to be treated with dignity. I don't feel like, I don't want to feel like a second class citizen. And it really hurts me um, to feel that my sexual orientation and who I am is not respected. So it kind of dawned on me that, uh, you know, it, it didn't previously dawn on me, to be honest, but I thought, okay, what can I do? And that was where it started. And that's why I met um, Alexander, and that's why I met Makiko, and I'm standing here. But from a business case, I witnessed firsthand one of the key business cases. A company, with respect to its employees, its biggest task is to bring out the best in your people, to make sure they have a safe environment to work in, and that they are able to bring their full selves to work so that, so, so that they can give the best to the company and through the company to society. Now, my report was a great lawyer. I, I, I work for a legal department, but he was very withdrawn. He was very senior, and he was withdrawn. He wouldn't take leadership. Um, he would be, uh, he would, you know, when he asks, when he's asked questions, legal questions, he would answer them superbly, but he wouldn't take initiative. And that changed when he came out and when he learned that the company accepted coming out and embraced it. His productivity, now you will question me, how do you measure productivity? But I know his productivity grew first six months from 100 to 120. And now it's three or four years, it's 200%. He now uh, leads many, many projects in the, f in the company that what I work for. Um, he leads the uh, LGBT network that we have in the firm. And I witnessed firsthand what it means to have an equal, embracing environment. And I imagined, OK, it won't be sufficient if it's just a corporate environment. It must be society, because we don't just live in our companies. We live in society, and what happens in society affects what happens in the co company and vice versa. So that's why I, um, I decided that marriage equality is something that we must aspire to. But there was a big, big difficult issue. I never heard of marriage equality, to be honest, until four years ago. And not many people in the corporate world have heard of it. And how do we, I think many people, if you ask them, in their hearts want to do something but they don't know how to express it. They don't know how to support it. So I think one of the things we were wondering is how do we get people to think about marriage equality, corporate world to think about marriage equality, and this is our inspiration. This is the uh, amicus brief that was su submitted in 2015 uh, when marriage equality uh, became uh, the rule of the land in the United States. That was June 2015. And as part of that litigation, 379 businesses submitted a brief arguing in, in corporate speak why marriage equality is required, uh, why it's a must for corporations. And so we were inspired by this. And so I think um, 
the American Chamber of Commerce and the uh, Chambers of Commerce you see here. And Alexander was instrumental in get, making this happen, um, made public their viewpoint on the corporate case for marriage equality. Because you know, when you engage people in society, you use different words depending on the person you're speaking to. If you're speaking to your child, you're speaking to your parents, you're speaking to your siblings, you use different language, right, uh, to, to get to the same result. So this is a corporate uh, rationale. And please read it, uh, it's available on the web. And, uh, but, uh, so the key message here, um, you know, diversity and inclusion, that's a message that resonates with the corporate world nowadays. Uh, more, more diverse and productive workplace. Productivity is exactly what I witnessed. International competitiveness. Obviously, we live in a very global world in, with very diverse people. And at the end of the day, corporate sells products and services. And for products and services to be purchased, people need to resonate with that. They want to purchase from your company. And um, you know, to have equality and for the company to uh, aspire to equality, I think is uh, critical in uh, um, realizing international competitiveness. Um, the last part is um, to underscore that Japan is already ready for marriage equality. But um, um, so more diverse and inclusive community. Um, diversity and inclusion is a key word. Diversity is um, a corporate strategy. Um, you have to cater to diverse needs uh, to be able to reach uh, uh, to, uh, uh, to society and your products and services to reach to, um, society. And you know, the world nowadays is all about innovation. And it's all about innovation. So in order to be innovative, you have to have multiple perspectives in this diverse world. And you can't have that unless the people that work for your company are diverse and accept diversity and listen to different views and have an open heart. But in order to achieve diversity in a company, you need to create inclu inclusivity. Inclusivity is a tool to achieve diversity in your company. Because if you worked for a company that had no benefits for uh, same-sex couples, would you feel comfortable working for that company? If you, you worked for a company that didn't speak about LGBT or sexual orientation, would you feel comfortable for working for that company? You wouldn't. You would go to a company that actually embraces that. So that's what diversity and inclusion is about for company. And it really dawned on me because of the person that came out to me. And I talked about uh, being productive. It really makes a difference. My, my colleague told me that he couldn't speak about his family, his partner, where he goes to on vacation. He can't go to drinks because if he goes to drinks, he has to lie. And he hates lying. And when you start lying, it just becomes all inconsistent. So he stopped coming to drinks. Because, so he stopped socializing. And if you have a company that, that's like that environment, obviously you're not going to get productivity out of that person. So productivity is intuitively something that happens. And international competitiveness. You want to, in, in this global economy, every global company needs to have tap from the best talent and, uh, uh, and retain those talent. And if, you, if Japan doesn't realize marriage equality, really talented people that are gay, or even if they're not gay, would go to, you know, can easily move to the United States and work there. So Japan and Japanese companies would lose talent. I think that's what international competitiveness means to me. And, you know, so, and Japan is, I don't know if you know, but um, the movement is happening. Um, uh, there are, um, Many, many companies have uh, started adopting uh, um, policies to treat LGBT employees e equally. The NHK poll says 51% of Japanese population supports freedom to marry. The most recent survey done by the ad agency Dentsu, uh, that was announced in January, says 78%. Obviously, you know, it's not the whole Japanese population, but uh, the number of people um, that accept is growing. But we have to get the conversation going because there are many, many non-recognizant people who don't know about it. But if we get the conversation going, the 78% is indicative where, where this could go. And you know, uh, Alexander touched about the local governments. Uh, it was only two local governments in 2015, and now it's 21 local governments. Local governments are starting from the grassroots. 
If you add the population in the 21 local governments that have adopted the um, partnership system, it's 10% of the Japanese population and growing. So there is the right environment, but people are not talking. People are not engaging in conversation. So uh, if you can ignite that conversation, things will change. So I'll, I'll leave it there and finally turn it over to Alexander to, to talk about the rest. <laughs> we do want to open for questions, but allow me to finish because I think uh, I really wanted to follow up on actual how we were able to succeed. We began Viewpoint uh, last year. LAN has now been uh, four years in existence. Every year we have our equality gala. If you're in town on September 19 this year, uh, please come. It's the day before the Rugby World Cup, so um, you know it's it's going to be a lot of festivities. Um, last year we were very lucky. Uh, we gave ACCJ a deadline um, in early of the year, saying, "Would you like to support this?" And so sort of they'll discuss internally because again. It requires conversation, exactly what you're talking about. And ACCJ conversation went to their members. And ACCJ asked their sustaining members and said, if we as a chamber announce the support um, for, uh, for marriage, if we make this recommendation here that we recommend the government of Japan to equalize marriage for LGBT couples, would you as our sustaining members, as our corporate members, support this? And overwhelmingly, the response came as a yes. Because SCJ does have the ability, and it's in his power and mission to advocate for change, to promote uh, what they believe is good for the corporates, exactly what Fujita Sensei was saying. And again, the, it's very simple. Equality is good for individuals. Uh, I can tell you personally. It's very good for business. We have a very, very successful lawyer here from the number, world, number one bank in the world. And it's good for Japan. I mean, we have a lot of people in Japan whom we know who are gay, who leave the country or don't, don't come here because actually they feel like they can do better elsewhere. Uh, I had a junior colleague who came to work for us for six months from London uh, because she wanted to help with land work. And it was interesting because you know, we talked about, do you want to stay here? And she said, look, Alexander, um, I grew up now in equality, where equal marriage is a matter of law, and society adopts it and accepts this. Why would I go back in time? I have a girlfriend whom I love, who would not understand this at all. We're back in time, and it hurts me because Japan is a wonderful place, and we're so, so much ahead of time in so many ways. This is one area, as well as women's rights, we can yet have yet to fix. Um, I wanted to share with you some phenomenal stats. We were able to go beyond the initial five chambers. And we now have, it says 36 endorsements, which could 37 endorsements as of this morning. Eight chambers now in, in, in Japan have supported the, and endorsed the idea that the government of Japan should pass the law on equal marriage. We have two major lawyers associations. Those are domestic Bengoshi lawyers associations, which I can't even belong to because I'm a New York lawyer. But they both came out in full swing support to say we as lawyers believe in this, and as corporate lawyers believe in this, in equality and fairness in Japan. We have 10 law firms. And critically, we have 10 corporates. I'll give you one, one more piece of news. This morning, Microsoft has joined this, 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 this group. Now, a lot of foreign names are here. But I wanted to point out to you, we have Mori Hamada here. Those of you who are in law, they know that's one of the most conservative and most one of the top four law firms in Japan. You have JAILA, the Japanese In-House Lawyers Association. This is a group of 5,000 Bengoshi who have adopted this, who belong to all sorts of Japanese companies, and not just foreign ones, who said we believe in equality. And this was a big success for us, to be honest. When I talk to you about ACCJ going to their, um, their, their members and asking them about support, the majority of ACCJ members are banks. And the banks are conservative, and they're not typically in the field of promoting equality or you know, making change. They're in the field of making money. Um, but, you know, you can't dismiss the corporates. They will have the ear of the government. And they will have the influence here. And we believe that we can help Market Coast campaign by engaging the big name corporates to go directly to Nagatacho, to influence in the ways that they can to make Japan 
more competitive and more equal. So two weeks ago on Friday, we had these six banks, many of, many of you know these names, um, have announced that they endorse that this, uh, the viewpoint on equal marriage. What was beautiful about this, it was not just the banks. Each bank's CEO in Japan emailed me to say, we want to support this. We discussed, and we believe it's important to us, to Japan, to our employees. And um, this is, again, the final slide. But I think what I want to finish is we do a lot of events at LAN. I'm very proud of what we've done. We do it. I mean, we work a lot uh, to make sure uh, this continues to be engaged in a social society. And we, we know we, we want to help Makiko and, and the society here. We have many events coming up. I'm just going to click through quickly. Um, if you want to come to see art, uh, one of our uh, uh, member firms, Clifford Chance, will host something on 27th of June. Uh, there's more information on any of this. Uh, there's a networking event. I'd love for you all to come. Uh, the proceeds of which will go to support predominantly the marriage campaign. Please come to Ju July 3rd. Nagashima Ono, those of you who don't know the law, is another major, major law firm in Japan. And it happens to be what's called the law firm of Nagatacho. For them to host the event to benefit the marriage equality is a big message. We obviously hope that the firm also will support the viewpoint, etc. But please come and support uh, the event. Students come for free if you want to come. Uh, those of you who are not students, um, there's, di there's different price tags for the, for the, for the, for the tickets. Um, and then look, we talked about Evan Wilson, the guy who is father of grandfather of marriage. We bring him annually here, father, grandfather. We bring him annually here. Evan's here for a week. We're doing a lot of uh, visits for him here in Tokyo. I'm going with him to Sapporo with Makiko's team there. And then Fujitsu is taking him to Fukuoka. We don't forget Japan is not just Tokyo. And not just, you know, Minami Azabu. We're everywhere. And again, our gala, um, please come. It's sold out event for the last four years. Um, um, it will be fun. And it's, will, it's usually very impactful. We wanted to open for questions. Kyle's been very patient with us. Uh, but I wanted to say thank you very much. Domo arigato gozaimashita. Father Paul Koroluk, Orthodox Church of Ukraine. You gave a list of 27 jurisdictions which recognize same gender marriage. Taiwan is an outlier there, not only because it's in Asia, but in the other 26 jurisdictions, the majority of the people identify themselves as Christians. And the only other jurisdiction I know which recognizes same gender marriage in some way is Israel, which is a Judea Christ country. How do you feel, is there any difference in the way arguments for equality must be presented in a non-Christian background? And going into Japan, which more, most people identify themselves as non-religious, will that also affect the way one must argue for equality? Um, for discussion purposes, yeah. because the discussion hasn't started yet. Mm -hmm. um, I think the fact that, let's start with the non-religious part. Um, whether Japan is non-religious or not, I think it's less religious um, than some of the other jurisdictions that you just mentioned. Um, I, don't, I, I think the argument is always the same. And I think the opposing arguments are always the same. That we don't, but we don't have the religious part as opposition. But the other op opposing arguments are always the same. It's, it contravenes traditional marriage. Marriage is always about man and woman. And even though you're, if you are non-religious, it's still a very strongly held belief, particularly by the conservative um, you know, uh, people in Japan, which there are a lot, and they, used to ha they usually have more political power, I think. And second, the argument is, and it was mentioned, that um, how can a family be raised by um, gay um, couples, and isn't marriage about procreation? And I think that's the other argument that's often made, and there are other uh, similar arguments. So I didn't a answer your question directly, like a good lawyer. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, um, I wanted to comment on part of your question. And uh, the part I haven't answered. Well, first of all, thank you for coming. I mean, obviously, I'm Ukrainian, so I'm very and proud. And I'm going to get in trouble for being here and standing here. So. <laughs> Uh, but thank you for being here and for raising an interesting question. Look, I think it's true. When you look at the list of countries, uh, it's predominantly Christian. I mean, Taiwan has a big, well, 
5% Christian minority, which is very um, powerful in sense of financial, etc. Um, th there's truth to that, that the Christian countries have been more supportive. And that's probably, you would know better why that's the case. Because ultimately, when you talk about marriage, um, we approach it as a, as a right. But there are, you know, there is a religious background to marriage, you know, where you, it is about love. It's about what society believes to be, should be encouraged. Look, for Canada, when we were the first ones, it was a big discussion, because no one in the world had that. And there was a question, you know, is this marriage really about love, about procreation, about, you know, what's good, what's wrong? And the ultimate answer was, from the point of view of the state, we want to support two people who love each other and who are in relationship to have equal rights. And interestingly, when you think about the history of marriage, for most of these countries, especially English history of marriage, divorce wasn't allowed. People say marriage is such a unique institution that doesn't change. That's not true. Divorce wasn't allowed. In the US, many of you would know, the interracial marriage wasn't allowed up until very recently. How crazy is that? In Canada, if you were Anglican and Catholic, you couldn't marry until the beginning of the century. The marriage definition and the way the state wanted to define it has had a lot of religious development. And you see now moving away from that and really saying the church has its own religious institution, but we as a state, we need to treat people equally. We want people to be happy. We want them to be, have families. We want them to have relationships which are dignified. And we want them to really feel that part of society. We're all different. We're all diverse. And the state has the last say in who should marry whom and who should sleep with whom and et cetera. And as the church, to be honest, that's how I feel. But ultimately, we, I think, and all of this, as Christian has said, when you look at all of the countries and all of the cases, it's the same argument. If you allow marriage as a legal right, and it's to support two loving individuals, there's no reason in law or otherwise to deny it to same-sex couples. The love is love. And we want everyone to be happy and to be equal and, and to be dignified. And it's a very easy fix. It won't take away from anyone else. And you see now 27 countries that have it. And people are very happy. And it's actually very, it's been very impactful. So I hope it answers. I, don't, I can't tell you about the religion connection. I think you would be right to point out that that connection, and probably there's truth to that. Again, my client and the very first marriage in the world was done in a church. That something says to you where the, the, the thinking about love, the law, God's love and the love of the individuals, that really went above and beyond what the law allowed. And the church took leadership in Canada. And to this day and forever, it will be the first equal marriage in the world. I think something to be proud of. But um, I don't know if you want to answer your question, but uh, Thank there, you. there we are. Thank you. <laughs> Good evening. I'm Canadian. And uh, I was a, a journalist uh, for many, many years, and one of my responsibilities was to cover the gay file. And so I was there when the Supreme Court made the big decision that you spoke about. I was there when the law was adopted in the Parliament. And I want to tell a short story, it won't take long, about, about Scott Bryson. Scott Bryson was the first, only, uh, first openly gay um, member of the cabinet, federal cabinet. And uh, he was also the first uh, nationally elected person to get married in 2007. And I remember, he continued to be in politics still very recently. And I remember one day we had a very big gathering of liberals. He was a liberal at the end, anyway. And uh, he said, oh, and we were a big bunch of journalists following him. And he said, oh, wait a minute, I have to wait for my husband. And so I said to him, because I knew him very well, I said to him, you, do you realize, Mr. Bison, that, we are, that you are one of the very rare minister in the world who can say, wait for my husband? And we all laugh. And by contrast, now I'm working for the NHK. And recently, I saw on TV a series of two reports about new families in Japan. And one of those new families were two lesbian women, obviously, who had a kid. And from the three 
stories, those women were the only one where their face were masked. We couldn't identify them and we couldn't identify their kid. And for me, it was very sad because I was thinking what we, we, we would have done in Canada, and I'm sure in Canada they would have been openly who they are, and we would have, we would have known their name. So my question is, uh, you said that 78% of people here in Japan are for gay marriage, but after seeing that, my question was, is there still such a big stigma here in Japan that people don't dare uh, live in an openly gay fashion? That's my question. Because I see the contrast between this and the 78%, so that's why uh, I'm asking that question. Thank you very much. Before you answer, uh, I think one, we'll have the Japanese people answer this question, obviously. There's one caveat. The 78% was of people up to 60 years of age. Ah. So those, you know, here in Japan, people live until 130. Okay. So uh, half the population w wasn't asked because, I mean, look, th they probably would not be as high. But I think there's a good answer for just as I can share with you. Okay. Well, I'm not going to make the answer because Makiko is going to answer. But uh, that, that survey, about 78%, is a dental survey of, I think, uh, 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 and also, you know, it's not the entire Japanese 1.2 uh, 120 million Japanese people. It was a group of people who responded to a survey. So I, I just want to make that. But I, I think it's indicative of the people that are supporting marriage equality once they think about it. So, Makiko uh, Sensei, I'm not good at English, so maybe I ask Fujita-san to translate. Okay. Okay. Good. あの、海外と比べて日本では あの、もちろん同性愛で罰されるってことはないので、海外よりも寛容であるというふうな考え方が言われることもありますが、実際には根深い差別偏見があります。So <笑> sometimes uh, it is said that um, um, because there is no criminalization of um, um, you know, homosexual activities in Japan, that uh, Japan is more uh, generous or tolerant um, to uh, same uh, uh, LGBT uh, compared to uh, overseas. But in reality, if you, in reality, there is uh, prejudice and discrimination. あの、コントがあったり、あるいは雑誌でもほもあのトレタレントはほもじゃないかっていう風なことがニュースになっていたりします。So, for example, if you look at TV um, programs, uh, there are uh, there are uh, programs that make fun of or make mockery of LGBT people, or if you read uh, magazines, there are magazines that uh, refer to LGBT people as homos, which is a very derogative term. 悲しいことに事件もあの時々あって、例えば2000年、ちょっと前ですけど、には、あの、東京の、あの、新木場という公園で、同性愛の人だけを襲う少年グループがいて、あの、殺人にも発展したという事件もありました。And very sadly there are also um um uh, the criminal cases that happened, uh, in, for example, in 2000, in, in a park called, uh, in an area called Shinkiba, a group of uh, children or, um, um, targeted specifically uh, homosexual people and uh, resulted in some deaths. Oh, wow. Okay. で、あの、私はこういうLGBTの この間も、ま、ちょっと前ですけど、あの、弁護士同士で、あの、飲んでいて、で、その中の一人の男性弁護士が、あの、ま、寺原さんがそういう活動をしているのはとても素晴らしくって、人権の問題だから重要だと思う
Um, but even among lawyers in Japan, um, I, I want to talk about uh, uh, um, something that happened. Um, I was having drinks with a group of lawyers, and one of the male lawyers uh, uh, came to me and said, oh, you know, Makiko, I think your activities are wonderful, uh, supporting human rights, and um, you know, I really, really respect you. And then one minute late, later, the very same lawyer was talking to another male lawyer and uh, making fun of him, saying, oh, you must be homo, and you must have one of those uh, things with you. And I was very shocked about it. あの、無知、無関心、無理解ということで、普段全然意識しないで、あの、傷つけるような行為を言ってしまうと。で、その頭ではこれは人権問題で差別はいけないんだと分かっている人でも、そのことと自分の行動が結びつくというところに至っていない
Pride Month that today is happening is about celebration. People question is why do we have pride? Because you want to be at the stage of celebrating your uniqueness, your diversity. But you have to go through other stages. Japan isn't there yet. And part of it is also, I believe, if you live here long enough, you know it's not a country where people want to rock the boat. You don't stick out in Japan. You, you learn very early on you should be like everyone else. Being gay being 7% or 8% is different. And it's demanding for your rights in court. And again, something not Japanese people do. In Canada, you know, our couples were very willing to be open about this. Very individualistic con country and, co and, and generally, we wanted to talk about who we are and we wanted to make the difference. Here, I think, people are mindful of destroying the harmony of society, which is very important. And in Taiwan, when we talk to lawyers in Taiwan, they used harmony, the same as concept here, to actually say, we want people to be harmonious. Because those lesbian and gay people who are not part of the harmony, the outside, the marriage institution will bring them in, and that will make the harmony better. Same thing for marriage. If when you bring people in, it will make the institution stronger and better. I believe it, and that, that's empirical evidence for you from many countries now. But let me pass to uh, my Japanese colleagues. Uh, um, you know, and, uh, unfortunately, the Japanese marriage system, the civil marriage in Japan, there are a lot of uh, unattractive aspects of it. 例えば先ほどちょっと申し上げたあの家制度ファミリーシステムだったりあの性を同じにしなきゃいけないっていうあの同う制度だったりあのいろいろ若い人がま若くなくてもですけどあの息苦しいと感じるような内容がまだ残っ
あの我々はそれを待てないもう待つことができないのであの訴訟をしキャンペーンをしているわけですけれどもあのたた確か信じているのはこの同性婚があの認められる過程でそのこの今パーフェクトではない結婚制度をあのよりこういい方向にあの変えるそれは異性愛の人にとっても、えー、カンフォータブルな内容に変えるいいきっかけなんじゃないかなというふうに考えています。So that's why I, we have started a litigation and a campaign to realize marriage equality because those people facing day to day difficulty and hardship cannot wait. But I also believe that through the discussions around marriage equality, that is inspired by both the litigation and the、uh, campaign, that people will think about.、Um, The, mar the Japanese marriage system that is not yet perfect, and also that will、um, go for a better change、uh, for heterosexual and same sex couples. So, I've been like,、um, I've, I've been like contemplating on the issue with like LGBT、um, marriage、uh, throughout Facebook and the decriminalization of LGBT. Like, for example,、uh, Ecuador a few days ago just legalized same sex marriage. So, congrats in Ecuador. And、um, Botswana officially decriminalized、um, equality of same sex, couple, same sex couples. And、um, now, look, looking at these, it's like progress is being made. And, and also,、um, Brazil just、um, made it a crime relating to、um, homophobia. They just like, made it a crime. So, looking at these progress,、um, As opposed, to, as opposed to Japan, why, are they so, why is Japan like, still reluctant on same sex marriage besides the fact that they kind of like misconstrue the Constitution and the fact that they say that historical marriage is, in,、uh, is a,、um, an institution bond between a man and a woman? Like, why is it that what factors, other factors may play a role on? This issue? Could it be like lack of sex education or are they just too afraid of redefining the term marriage? So,、um, I guess your question is、um, although there's a lot of progress being made in various parts of the world,、uh, why isn't Japan、uh, making the same type of progress?、Um, was your question, right? Right. And you were saying, is that lack of sex education or you know, whether it's people are stuck with a defin、uh, traditional、uh, definition of marriage?、Mm -hmm. um, I, I think, to be honest, you know, it's as、um, Makiko was saying, it's first people don't recognize the issue exists, they're ignorant about it.、Mm -hmm. And for society to change, for the lawmakers to change, Um, first, they need to understand that there are people who are suffering as a result of this and that it's hurting society. And they also need to understand that a majority of the uh, society uh, supports change. That's what I think what motivates lawmakers、uh, to make change. And we need to change the law because all of the cases you mentioned w a s about changing the law.、Right. So,、um, you know, I think if people really start talking about it, And understanding about there may be some hardcore oppositions,、mm -hmm. but I, you know, it's my personal belief that that won't be the majority. So, my belief is, and you know, I, I think everyone has different views around this. My belief is the conversation hasn't started, and because the conversation hasn't started, people don't know or realize that there are people who are suffering or hardship or the inequality of all of this. That was the case for me. Four years ago, I didn't know any real gay person. So, when I, whenever I heard about LGBT, it was on the news and it goes from my ear, right ear,、oh, sorry, this is my left ear, <laughs> and goes through to my right ear. <laughs> and, my right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so,、um, I, I think that's my take. But,、um, Terahara says? She says she agrees. <laughs> yeah, I got, a,、uh, I, got another, I, I got another question. So,、um, You know, you know, every、uh, June we have these LGBT pride、uh, parades. So,、um, if, we, if we continue these prides, and you have like, se I think, 73 other countries that criminalize、uh, same, sex, uh, same sex couple, same sex marriage, 10 of those、uh, whom 
uh, are punishable by death. Do you think um, if we keep these LGBT prides going, these countries are going to look at us and say, hey, these guys are not so bad. Why can't we be like those guys? Do you think that's going to happen someday? Like, officially, the whole world would end the discrimination on same sex? I mean, I don't know if you're if you're gay or not, but I think being proud of being gay is is a long process. Mm -hmm. um, you don't start, you know, especially maybe younger generation growing up now with equal marriage will feel easy about it. <clears throat> um, I'm not young, so I can talk about you know certain generations. <clears throat> the pride is again is about the celebrating of diversity and inclusion and and who you are. We live in society here where I think uh, the question about people being in the mask and some of the people in the marriage lawsuit not being even present in the lawsuit is because, you know, they might still not be there. You're right. I mean, if you have pride events in New York, and I think you're going there, right? Um, 50th year anniversary of Stonewall this year. Um, it's only not long ago where even in the U.S., you know, you probably could have been that because you were gay, actually. Um, we have progressed quite dramatically internationally, uh, especially because of societal change, ultimately. Sometimes courts led the way, legislators led the way, society, politicians, media, a uh, very important player in this is media. Uh, people, role models on TV, I always think of Ellen DeGeneres, when she came out, it was a big shock because she was very much loved by kind of red states in the states and oh my God, we have lesbian in our bedroom because, you know, uh, <clears throat> I mean, that's what literally one of my friends said to me. Um, um, it's, it makes it, you know, you, you, like Christian Sensei was saying, you don't think of, you think of gay people like, oh, it's like those people who dress like women and, you know, whatever. Um, and then here they are, they're, you know, they're corporate lawyers and they're bankers. Um, for, uh, I think the real question is, is for the community, how strong we are to make our voices heard. It's not easy to sit here and just talk about, here I am, you know, who I am and please recognize my rights. That's not easy, to be honest, and it's not something that many of us want to do and, and are willing to do. We have to take leadership and commitment. Same thing for you, Fujita Sensei, you know, you belong to be corporate. You know, you, you have priorities and you take time to do it. Um, so to answer your question, I think, is, is a lot, there's a lot, lot of underlying things I can share with you, maybe over drinks even better. Um, <laughs> but ultimately, I hope the world will change because they see that gay people are just like everyone else. Mm -hmm. Because we are. You know, we like sumo, we like basketball, we do all these things. You know, um, that our love is, you know, love is love and that's who we are. And I hope uh, that countries where there is criminalization uh, of homosexuality, they will also see that it's actually it's okay to be gay, and it's you know you can't convert people into being gay. I mean, I was born in Russia, um, and they have anti-propaganda law, mm -hmm. which basically says that you know you can't uh, um, promote any gay uh, propaganda. And I give you an example: there was a bridge in one of the small cities in Russia which was painted in rainbow. Uh, it was a rainbow bridge. They repainted the bridge. They were like, oh, the bridge is going to make you gay. I mean, you know, I mean, it, I mean, it just, it's, it, you know, it's again the point about ignorance and this fear of diversity. So I think you have to embrace and you have to have an open heart. Here in Japan, I believe we do have open hearts here. And I hope that will lead us to some changes and your lawsuit being um, moving fast. I hope we answered your questions. Thank you very much. Sure. Um, my name is Don, and uh, I have an observation and a question for the whole panel. Um, I think the presentation has a lot of nice ex examples about what the world does, uh, but I think you've pointed out that in terms of Japan, things are very slow. Um, also, there are people who are not very educated, or if they know, they don't really um, come to support. Um, I think the presentation also mentioned that if we just ask the lawmakers to change the laws, that it would make people who are wanting to get married be happy. But I was thinking about the other side, which is the actual families and the community support. So I was wondering, with your organizations, what are you doing in parallel to trying to convince the lawmakers? Are you also reaching out to the communities and having these discussions so there is education, so when the law comes in, that there's support on both sides? Or is there something else that's being done? 
I'll talk about land very briefly. Michael Kassan will, will talk about the more campaign issue. Uh, we got together as lawyers to be able exactly to promote LGBT rights. Uh, and you're right, it's all, all about family ultimately. We, we, we want to belong to family, to Japan, to society, to corporates. We wanna, that's, that's the desire that most gay people have. Um, it is tricky because many families do not accept gay people. Yeah. And it's not just in Japan, it's many other cases. Um, look, the change has to happen everywhere, and it's it's much harder to be a gay person and to do to, to go every single day. I'm in a taxi, and the taxi driver says, ask, "Oh, you know, you have a Japanese girlfriend?" You know, no, I don't actually. <laughs> um, you know, <laughs> but I don't need to come out to every single person I meet. It's hard enough to do it once in a while with, in front of you. I don't know most of you here, but it's hard. It's kind of hard, yeah. Mm. Um, with family, it's even harder because you know you don't want to disappoint them because they have their own perceptions of you're going to be oh this and that and the other. We're and have eight grandkids and you know all those things um, but um, it, it's a very personal issue and I think families uh, are, need to be engaged and uh, you know church for instance has to be also inspire the love and acceptance and, and understanding and, 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 and government too and corporates too and families to everyone um, so you know look we're all diverse you know Don you you know, I don't know you from the states probably or, uh, you know, I'm, you know, we all have different backgrounds, right? So when you walk down the street, you want to think of a human being. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter, actually, you know, many other things, but we're all human beings. So. あの、ま、さしく今、あの、質問していただいていたように、聞く人々の心を変えなきゃいけない、あの、考え方を変えなきゃいけないということで設立したのがマリッジフォーオージャパンと so, uh, I, you, know, um, I, you know, as you've said, you know, what we really need to focus on is changing the mind of the people. So, and that is exactly what we're trying to do through my organization, Marriage for Japan. Mm. ま、so uh, our organization currently is primarily lawyers uh, and about 30 lawyers, but um, in order to uh, change people's mind, we form various different team, uh, teams. Um, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> so katakana <laughs> to. Teams, and uh, they include things like lobbying against the lawmakers, research to get the right data to people because data is very powerful. Uh, we organize events, there's a team that focused on organizing events. There are people organized on the ever-powerful SNS, targeting SNSs, and there are teams that are focused on getting corporate engagement, and there are uh, teams focused on creating uh, lectures that would reach the hearts of the people. And uh, another strategy we have is to team up with other organizations that have um, uh, uh, influential um, influence in society. で、まさしく今日ここに来る前も実はあの so um, this very day, just before this event, I was actually at the, um, the, the congressman's uh, house, mm -hmm. you know, where all the congressmen have their offices. And we were actually meeting with a person who cannot be named at this point in time, but a very famous and uh, influential lawmaker. And we took uh, our plaintiffs, uh, to that uh, lawmaker and um, appealed to him and uh, explained to him the uh, hardships 
that the people he sees in front of them, uh, in front of him, uh, are going through. And our um, team's plan is to do this at least once a week. でもやはりその運命家、政治家と話していて、いつも思う、今日も思ったし、あの、とのは、やはりあの政治家、原産を犯すには、有権者、結局その投票する我々、あの一般市民の方を動かすということが、あの議員さんを動かすということになるということを毎回感じているのでそのためにはやはりまあ今日は皆さんももともと理解のある方々ですけども一回一回は人数はたくさんではなくてもこういうイベントを繰り返したりまあムービーを作ってあのみんなに見てもらったりっていうその地道な活動というのがやっぱり重要になってくるというふうにあの感じています。But what really dawned on me today when I was speaking with this lawmaker and um, um, for a long time is that、um, in order to move law lawmakers, you have to move the voters. And so,、um, you know, events like these or creating movies that are designed to promote understanding、uh, is very important. And such type of jimichina,、uh, how do you say it in English? Jimichina.、Um, Steadily and slowly and、yeah. persistent, I guess,、yeah. type of activity. Gradual. Yeah, yeah. gradual、mm -hmm. is very important. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you for your very informative presentation.、Um, so, the fight for marriage equality, of course,、um, aims to promote、um, inclusiveness and diversity. And, of course, those principles must also be extended to、um, all members of the LGBT community. So,、uh, that includes transgender people and people who.、Um, uh, uh, Gender queer people and people who don't identify within the traditional male female、uh, gender binary. So, I was wondering if you could tell us more about、um, the current state of transgender rights in Japan and、um, also、uh, what kind of efforts are being under undertaken at the moment to address the lack of them. の方々の活動が活発で、2003年に、えー、性別の変更ができるという法律ができています。So、uh, this may be actually the other way round compared to other countries, but in Japan,、uh, the、uh, activities、uh, for the rights of transgender people actually preceded、uh, the、uh, sexual orientation uh, uh, people and、um, As you may know, in 2003, a law was passed to allow、um, assignment of your sex so that it is the same as your、uh, gender identity. それはすごくプログレスではあったんですけども、海外と比べてとても要件が厳しい、特に、えー、体の手術をしなければ性別が変更できない。手術というのはその女性であれば子宮を取ったり卵巣を取ったりということで子どもができなくするための手術をしなければいけないというとても高いハードルがあります。OK, I need some help in translating some of the organ <laughs> translations, but、um, uh, although that, the 2003 law that allow, allows assignment of your,、um, I guess, uh, uh, official um, sex, Uh, that can be said progress, but in Japan,、uh, compared to、uh, foreign countries, there's a very, very、um, severe requirement. And one of that is that you have to undergo surgery to assign your sex. And that basically is、uh, surgery to remove your ability to bear children. So remove your, you know what. <laughs> ですのでその当事者の団体はもうずっとあの何年もそのハードルを変更するようにっていうことを活動しているしあの実は私も、えっと、日本弁護士連合会の中にその,その法律を変えるためのプロジェクトチームがあって、えー、そこで、えーまあ、意見書を書いたりあの当事者のヒアリングをしたり働きかけをしたりあのということをやっています。So,、um, I, you know, both the 
people who are uh, organizations um, that are transgender people, or transgender people are striving for, for quite a long time, I think, very, very hard to remove this requirement. And I'm also part of the Japan Federation of Bar Association, that's like the American Bar Association of Japan. Um, um, there is a project in the Japan Federation Bar Association where we have a working group uh, that um, writes uh, uh, legal opinions uh, saying that's unconstitutional, we conduct hearing, and we try to hataraki-kake, uh, persuade uh, the relevant stakeholders to change it. Thank you very much. で、その要は、ニューヨークが厳しいので、え、結局その性的思考がヘテロセクシャルでも法律上は同性カップルという状況が起きるわけです。例えば、えっと、性別が戸籍上は女性で心が男性で、でも手術をま、するには色んなハードルがあるので、手術ができなくて性別が変えられないとすると法律上はえっと、女性のままで、だけど異性愛なので、え、女性が好きとすると法律上
who has been a member of Slega uh, Yaku for how many years now? Decade, over a decade, yeah? Was the first LGBT member of, of KU in Japan who is transgender. I mean, there's some good victories here, as, as you were saying, sometimes ahead of the LGBT. Because actually, for transgender, it's much more difficult. We can hide. For them, it's very difficult to hide, actually. They have a much bigger hurdle to overcome. So they're, they're a bit more of a um, troublemakers in a sense, but really making sure that they get uh, to equality quicker. So thank you. Thank you. Hello, my name is Greg Rolf. I'm currently serving as Deputy Head of Mission at the Australian Embassy here in Tokyo. But a couple of personal observations. Um, just getting back to the comment about pride marches before, when I first marched in the Sydney Mardi Gras back in the early 1980s, it was still illegal to be gay in New South Wales. Colleagues of mine who'd marched in the first march in 1978 had been arrested. Other people had lost their jobs. When I last marched in the Sydney Mardi Gras, it was as part of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs team of people marching. We had 80 people from our ministry there, and I was one of the ministry's official LGBTI champions. So that was a long way to come in quite a short space of time. Another thing, just as a personal observation, of course, as you all know, Australia changed its legislation last year to enable gay marriage. And as it happens, my partner and I were the first men to be married in the ACT, the Australian Capital Territory. <laughs> after a fairly long engagement period. Um, <laughs> but we got there in the end. And one of the things that really struck me in the course of the long battle for marriage equality in Australia was the important role that families played. It was people like mothers, sisters, brothers, fathers, aunts, grandmothers, speaking out on behalf of the cause because they knew that it mattered to their family members who they loved. And that was, I think, only possible because we were comfortable being part of our families and involving our partners as part of our families. It might still be a bit harder in Japan, but I think it's going to be an essential part of the way forward here as well. Thank you. And just uh, thank you for this. I just want to say on behalf of LAN, we had a pleasure of being hosted by your embassy on a couple of occasions. Uh, you keep sending very prominent gay people to serve here. And you know it makes a difference. When you have a gay diplomat like you, and people before you who can influence the Japanese lawmakers in a soft power. It makes a difference, actually. Because again, it may be that they've never met a gay person. You come with your partner, they might never met a gay couple, to be honest. Don't forget how much of that, and you know you've done this in Australia, but you bring this also here. Please use it, actually, because it does help the Japanese com c culture companies, but it makes a big difference on a higher level. We want people to know that we're visible. Uh, Justice Kirby. A uh, famous Australian judge came to our gala twice from Australia. He's 100 years old now. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and he also had a very long engagement, right? 49 years before he was able to marry his partner. And he came to Japan to our gala twice to make a very passionate speech about his vision for Japan and the world to make it d different. And, and he th said to us last time, remember, he said, said we want, where are the Japanese gay judges? Where are the Japanese gay politicians? Where the Japanese gay role models in running companies, etc., we're still missing it. But we have people from Australia who can serve its face initially and inspire the Japanese people around you. So don't forget that you have a, you have a very strong, strong soft power to, to, with you. So thanks for being here. Hello, um, I'm also from the Australian Embassy, Julia Ward. <laughs> Didn't plan it that way. <laughs> Um, Makiko-san, I, I found your explanation of the purpose um, behind Article 24 really interesting. I hadn't heard that argument before. Um, I was wondering if you could explain a little bit about the um, argument about the interpretation of the term dose, both sexes. Thank you. Hi. Kumimo. <laughs> 反対派の人も、えっと、憲法24条1項の両性、暴セクシーズっていうのは男女を指すというふうに解釈をしています。So, um, both the government and people who oppose marriage equality um, interpret uh, both sexes as meaning man and woman. で、まあ、それは当然といえば当然で、この憲法ができたのがえっと 
。はい、1945年で、その頃にはまだ、今以上にもちろん LGBT の方々が、あの、見えていなかった、可視化されていなかったので、えー、同性カップルがいるということすら認識されていない中で作られているので、もちろん作られた当時は、これは男女を意味するものだったということは、それは否定できないと思います。And that's also, of course, quite natural as an interpretation from that time because the con Japanese constitution was enacted in 1945. And at that time,、um, probably there was no <laughs> recognition of the L LGBT people were totally untransparent to people and society. So people who enacted it didn't, couldn't have ever thought about、uh, same sex couples. ですがあの憲法も法律もその文言自体が重要というよりもそれをどう解釈するかということが重要でそれはこの,あの条項に限らずどの条項も時代の変化とか人々の考え方の意識の変化に伴って解釈というものはあの当然に変わってくるものです。This is getting like a constitutional class. <laughs>、uh, But, um, なんだっけ、ah, But、uh, with respect to both the constitution and even、uh, law,、uh, what's, more, what's important is not the literal reading of the text, but the interpretation of the meaning behind the text. So、um, all, 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 all those provisions should be interpreted in light of the change in society and um, uh, people's. Um, Perceptions. <laughs> なので、この数十年の日本の国内、あるいは国外のこの、えー、同性カップルに関する、えー、意識だったり、えー、というものの変化あを踏まえて、えー、考えると、えー、当然にあって、かつそのこの背景にある、もともとのこの条項が作られた。趣旨から考えると、今、この両性というのを男女と呼んで、同性カップルには婚姻の自由がないというふうに解釈するのは、とても理論的ではないというふうに思います。So, if you think about the change in society, the perception of society about same sex couples over the past decade, and also if you think about The original intent and purpose of people who made this law that was to deny、uh, the house, family、uh, household system whereby the head of the house could deny marriage. So, if you put that together, then um, um, you know,、uh, it would not be logical、uh, to interpret、uh, both sexes as、uh, being limited to man and woman. Oh, okay. <laughs> Julian, you have 30 seconds. Yeah, I know. It, it's real quick. I'm sorry. Real quick.、Um, I'm a recent graduate of Waseda Graduate School of Law, and I brought three others with me. So, represent. Anyways,、um, <laughs> and Alex, I'll talk to you after for a quick second. But my question was actually pertaining literally to this wonderful diplomat here, since you brought it up,、um, and I was thinking about it. Japan doesn't have gay marriage yet, but a variety of other countries, as is mentioned, does. What happens in terms of the Japanese government's recognition of those countries that do have gay marriage in terms of diplomatic issues when a diplomat has a spouse who is in a gay relationship? Do they, do they recognize it? Do they not? Do they do kind of the voluntary? What do we do? I don't know. I do. Okay, okay, okay. So, you know, just I'm, I'm curious. Not, not, not the pun, not the pun. Just because I happen to know the answer to that question, we're actually recognized these days, we're on the dip list. Just like any other couple.、Um, so, that was a reform that came through about 18 months to two years ago. Up until that point, we weren't. You couldn't have your same sex partner on the diplomatic list. Now you can. And there's, in fact, quite a lot of embassies have them. Very quickly, for, for Japan, I mean, I think, you know, for diplomats, it's easy.、Eh? I mean, they, have, they have good lives.、Uh, <laughs> typically, <laughs> typically.、Um, we've seen your chambers, beautiful.、Um, for、uh, non gay couples,、uh, look, there are no immigration rights. Even if you're married in the country, one of 27 countries, and you want to bring someone here, there is no automatic right for a visa. It's discretion. And we've seen cases where discretion was not utilized in a positive way. Sometimes there were delays, people didn't come right away. 
oftentimes people come here and have to come here every three months or go to school. I mean, look, it's crazy. Um, it's worse if you have a partnership, you know, um, then, then it's not, probably not going to get a visa at all. And it doesn't apply if one of them is Japanese. So if you have a Japanese spouse, a non-Japanese spouse, and they want to come back here or a sponsor, that's not going to happen at all. Japan very, very carefully protects this whole idea of man and woman for marriage. For foreigners, because we're gaijin, we're kind of crazy, so that's OK. But once you start getting into that idea, one is Japanese, one is non-Japanese, they, they, they will not issue the visa. It's, it's, uh, it's not possible. And we have examples where a major Japanese bank had a senior person trying to come. Well, they wanted to bring her back from London, but she was married to a woman and ref was refusing to come back and actually uh, you know, the lobbying was done, but still, it was still very difficult to do, to be honest. So, let's, make, let's change the law, let's, let's change the world. Um, I want to finish with something, Naomi Osaka, who is my personal hero, and, and the face of Japan, the new Japan, that, that, that is diverse Japan, uh, you know, in her new commercial says, don't change yourself, change the world. Let's do that. Thank you.